My name's Jamie Andrews. I'm Head of English and Drama here, and it's my very, very great pleasure to be introducing tonight's event. At the British Library, we were the home of writing and writers. We're great champions of writing and writers across, across centuries, across millennia even. Uh, and in light of that, I think it's really appropriate, and we're really proud to be hosting tonight's event, which celebrates John Lennon, the writer, and most particularly, John Lennon, the letter writer. Um, we uh, have known Hunter for quite a while, and so when he mentioned this project uh, of his John Lennon letters, we uh, immediately talked to him about how we might help celebrate the book uh, and launch the book. Uh, and uh, it's been an absolute pleasure knowing Hunter for, uh, for so long. And when uh, Hunter started talking about the project, we realised something that we didn't uh, understand before, just how widely John corresponded. And many of you in the audience will know that very well, because he corresponded with some of you. And I know that people in the audience have received letters from John, knew John, and corresponded with him. And I think that makes tonight um, a particularly special gathering, and we're very aware of that, and we're very grateful to you all for coming. Uh, so some of those letters that some of you received are part of the 300 or so letters that Hunter has collected for the first time and edited as part of his book. And in just a minute, Hunter's going to talk a little bit about that process of collecting, finding, and editing the John Lennon Letters, which has been published by Orion on Tuesday. Uh, and knowing Hunter as I do, I know that it's going to be a real treat. And knowing Hunter as I do, I also just want to say a few words about Hunter and the British Library. Now, I've had the pleasure of knowing Hunter for a few years now, but Hunter first uh, got to know the library back in 1985, when we were at Bloomsbury, which was uh, a little bit before my time, uh, when Hunter approached the trustees of the British Library with a really quite remarkable proposition. Now, those of you who know Hunter will know that he has established the largest single collection of Beatles lyrics. So that's handwritten lyrics of some of the most, uh, the most famous songs in the history of popular music. And Hunter had been collecting them through his time hanging out with the band in the studio on the road. And when he approached the library in 1985, he offered to place these, these lyrics on loan at the British Library. And uh, I'm quite relieved to report that the trustees were overjoyed with the suggestion and uh, very, very happy to accept. And so we've had these lyrics at the library now for coming on 30 years. They've been on permanent display in our treasures gallery alongside other treasures such as, other global treasures such as uh, Shakespeare's first folio, copy of the Magna Carta, uh, and they've been absolutely admired and enjoyed by everyone from royalty to school children who comes to visit. Uh, and personally, I got to know Hunter just a few years ago when uh, we started working together to try and see if we could make this loan something permanent, to be permanently part of the national uh, collections here at the British Library. And in light of that, we've been really excited to, uh, to follow the progress of a new scheme that the government's introducing called the Cultural Gift Scheme. And we're very excited about that being brought in very, very soon. So um, watch this space as far as that's concerned. And from that working with Hunter, I do just want to say that um, he really is the most uh, kind and generous man to work with. Really, really is the case. Absolutely crucially, he's so much fun to work with as well. And when you're dealing with government paperwork for insurance, that really, really counts. Um, and I really wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't just take this opportunity on behalf of the library to say how grateful we are to Hunter for everything he's done with us and for everything he's doing with us. So with that said, I'm going to hand over to Hunter. He's going to talk for about 40 minutes or so about the process of editing the book, about gathering the letters, and then we're going to open up to questions for 20 minutes or so. Uh, and afterwards, don't, don't rush away, because Hunter will be signing copies of the Lennon letters. But for now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please give a very warm welcome to Hunter Davis. Thank you, Jamie. <coughs> Jamie is the best dressed man in the whole of the British Library <laughs> and the competition is intense. <laughs> he could be a good PR, couldn't he? He should be working around that work in the British Library. I feel a bit worried talking about the Beatles. Anyway, thanks everyone for coming here this evening. It's a massive turnout. I'm absolutely thrilled. If any of you have come down from Birmingham from the Conservative Conference, you don't have to <laughs> clap because obviously you've been clapping all week. If you're en route to Wembley, I'm sure Alan's en route to Wembley to see the giants of San Marino, well, this will be a nice, quiet evening for you before the excitement of tomorrow. The thing about the Beatles is that I always make mistakes about them because 
There are so many world experts on beetle brains. Quite a few of them are here this evening. And I always forget things. I forget the uh, sequence of events. I can't spell the names of the associated people. I get the records in the wrong order. And, but people think I should know it because I did this book 44 years ago. But the thing about this book was that um, when I finished it, since then I've done 40 other books. I haven't done a Beatles book since. And so my mind is filled with all these other topics. And when I've finished each book, it's like an exam. You wipe it from your memory. So I bow to the, the knowledge of the real Beatles brains, which I am not, so I apologise when I get things wrong. But I'm a Beatles enthusiast, so all these 40 years I've been still loving the music, still playing the music. I think they're hugely significant as a cultural force. And I'm a massive collector, so I've got about 2,000 items of Beatles stuff. So I'm an enthusiast rather than an expert. So what I was going to do this evening is do three little things. One is tell you the background to how I came to do their biography in the first place. Then I'm going to talk about the letters, which Jamie's just been talking about. And then I'm going to show the world premiere. That's a joke. I'm going to show uh, a little film, which you won't have seen before, at the end, just a five minute film. So first of all, how I came to do the Beatles biography was I asked. In 1966, I was working on the Sunday Times and I was writing a column called the Atticus Column, which is still going today. In those days we did, I joined the paper in 1960 on, as the boy on the Atticus Column and we did bishops and we interviewed ambassadors and uh, it was really boring stuff. And about the middle of the 60s, the 60s arrived about 1964, then suddenly everything changed. And I became the boss of the column, and I stopped doing bishops and ambassadors, and I did footballers like George Best. I did uh, Cockney photographers like David Bailey. I did gritty northern novelists, and I did the Beatles. And in 1966, I went to see Paul McCartney in St John's uh, Wood in the house, which he still has, because I thought... Eleanor Rigby had just come out, and I thought, not just the tune, but I thought the words were brilliant. I thought they were really good. And I went to see him, interview him, did the piece, and I said, rather arse-licking in the piece, that it was the best poetry that would be published this year. And Kenneth Tynan wrote to me and said, yes, I agree with you. It will be the best poetry published this year. Six months later, I went to see Paul again in his lovely house, and by this time... I'd written a novel called Here We Go Around the Mulberry Bush, which has been made into a film. And we hoped that Paul would do the theme tune for it because he did a few bits of music for other people in the 60s. So I went to see him with the director of the film and I had a different hat on this time. I was a screenplay writer, not a, a hack journalist. And during that meeting, he turned the idea down. I said, you know, there should be a proper biography of the Beatles, uh, a hardback book. There have been two little books already, both paperbacks, perfectly okay, but they didn't tell you much about, they hadn't interviewed them properly and they hadn't done the background. I said, for the rest of your life, when people ask you the same dopey questions, such as why do, why do you spell the Beatles in that silly way, which people were still asking in 1966, why have you got your hair like that? You can say it's all in the book. And he said, excellent idea, but you'll have to get permission from Brian Epstein, their manager. And Paul, there and then, helped me write the letter because he's so charming and PR-orientated. So I wrote a letter with Paul's help to Brian and Brian kept on cancelling and it went on and on cancelling. I thought, oh, God, it's collapsed before it's got going. Then eventually, I got an appointment with him in Chapel Street in Belgravia. And I, went, I thought my agent was coming. At the time, I had an agent called Richard Simon. And lo and behold, when we got to the house, this tall, distinguished man called Spencer, if enemies here from publishing, Spencer Curtis Brown appeared. I thought he was dead. <laughs> Curtis Brown's the biggest then, I think still today, agency in the world, well, in Britain. And I didn't know there actually had been a Curtis Brown. But everybody was so uh, desperate to get into Brian Epstein's house, he chucked my poor agent out and done all the work. And he ponced him. I remember sitting, waiting for Brian, Brian was only two years older than me, but looking back to 1966, he seemed so sophisticated and cultured and uh, well-dressed and 
a real empresario. I was so impressed by him. I didn't know the truth that was going on in his life. While I was waiting for him in his room, I saw two Lowry oil paintings. I'd never seen Lowry oil paintings before. Henry Brown arrived, and it was charming. And we agreed the deal. And he suddenly said, he offered us another clause in the, in the contract. Nobody had asked him for this. He said, I will write him that I will give no access to any other writer for two years after the book comes out. So this is 1966 when we're chatting. The book came out in 68, and in 1970, the Beatles were no more. So my book, by luck for me and chance, but really by default, it became the only authorised Beatles biography because nobody was given access afterwards. But when I was doing the book, I didn't know that. Brian, the reason for him cancelling was that uh, he was a depressive and he was on pills and he was a homosexual, but he was a very complicated homosexual. He used to pick up sailors and boys and people who were butch, who weren't gay, and he'd bring them back to his house, give them drugs and drink and give them presents. And then he'd try to get them into bed and they would beat him up. And that was his masochistic pleasure. So he was an absolute torment when he'd wake up, because there were still things, there were still acetates of Beatle things, and he'd have hysterics. The Beatle knew he was gay, but it was never discussed. And don't forget, it was against the law in 1966. So Brian agreed my contract, which is excellent. Uh, it was £3,000 advance shared with the Beatles. And I went back to Heinemann, the publisher, and told them, and several directors said, oh, we know everything we want to know about the Beatles. And anyway, the bubble will burst very soon. This is 66. And I said, it's not really, it's more social history. And they said, oh, who wants social history? I spent the first six months on the book not interviewing the Beatles. I thought, they're the most famous boys on the planet. They've been asked so many questions. So I just got, I thought I'd only come back and talk to them properly when I had things to tell them. So I got from them a list of the contacts, uh, who were their best friends at school, the masters they liked, people they met, uh, mums and dads. I said, ring your mum and dad and say it's all okay. So during those first six months, I went up to Liverpool, first of all, and I was desperate to see Pete Best. I'm sure you all know, most of you know the, Be the Beatles story, and Pete Best was the drummer who got the push when Ringo came along. And poor old Pete Best, who'd been with them for two or three years in Hamburg, was written out of the story. And I wanted to see Pete Best, even though I was doing the, we didn't call it then, the authorised biography, I was desperate to get hold of Pete. Not just for his memories, because also his mother, Mona, ran, ran a little coffee bar club where the Beatles played before they graduated at the Cavern. So she had a big influence in their life. So I rang her and wrote to her, and she wouldn't see me. She said, why should I see you? The Beatles were horrible to my Pete. But she let me come and see her. It's in a very posh house and the, in Heyman's Green, Liverpool. And the basement was where she'd had this little coffee bar. And so, again, she said, why should I help you? Uh, the Beatles were horrible. So I said, look, even though it's official biography, I want to hear your story, and I promise uh, I will write it down as you tell me. So I talked to her into it, and suddenly the door opened, and Pete had been listening to the whole conversation. And he came in wearing a sort of white uniform, and he'd come from the night shift in the bakery where he was slicing bread for eight shillings an hour or eight shillings a day, some appalling low wage. And he, did, he looked tired and a bit depressed, but I talked to him, and he told me all about his life and what it was like when the Beatles sacked him. Uh, whatever it was, five years earlier, four years earlier. I went to see the mums and dads. And this was, I wish really I'd written more about this because it was, to me, it was the first time I'd seen, in fact, it's the first time really in British sort of social history that they, their sons had become, at the age of 18 to 20, incredibly famous, incredibly wealthy, and incredibly powerful, and they become, in a way, monsters. It was the Wordsworth thing, the childless father of the man. They uh, were household names. And the, the speed at which this happened 
happens today all the time with footballers. I actually did Wayne Rooney's biography 40 years later, and it was strange going to Liverpool to see Wayne Rooney's mum and dad, and it took me back 40 years to see the Beatles' mums and dad, because they'd moved from their council house, or their terrace house, into these suburban posh houses, and Ringo's mum and dad was just stuck there in Aspic. There was still next door neighbours an accountant and a doctor, and they couldn't speak to them, didn't know the area, and all the furniture was still covered in plastic. And they were like rabbits that were caught and even though I'd spoken to them, before they really talked to me, they had to ring Ringo to say, is it, they were so scared to talk. Uh, Paul's dad was lovely. Paul's dad was actually one of nature's gentlemen. He always wore a little flower. And even though he, he was a, a cotton salesman, I never got out what that meant. <laughs> and you know that Paul's dad, Jim, brought up the two boys when the mother died. And he just recently got married and the family didn't quite like the new woman he had married. But he lived in a lovely house in the, the Wirral, Heswell, and he had a conservatory and he had vine, and Paul had brought him a... And he was a lovely man, and I liked his new, his new wife because the boys had grown up. I remember while I stayed the evening with Jim McCartney, Paul sent up the acetate of When I'm 64, which is written for Jim. And we all played it over and over the whole evening, dancing around. I went to see... George Harrison's mother was lovely because she'd supported them all the way through. I went to see Mimi. So all the mums and dads had been moved from their house, mainly because they were being pestered. They couldn't uh, live there anymore for the, the fans. Same, happened with, same thing happened with uh, Wayne Rooney. They moved from their council house. It was even worse because their house had been vandalised, first of all, by Liverpool fans when he played for Everton. Then when he moved to Man, so they had to move. Aunt Mimi had moved right away and she'd moved to Canforth Cliffs in Bournemouth on the south coast. So I went down to see Mimi. Mimi, for those that don't know, brought up John from the age of five. And Mimi was telling me how that she'd had to leave Liverpool. She'd been ill and she got up and she heard somebody downstairs thinking the doctor had come. And she came downstairs and three girls had got in somehow and they were ratching through her sewing basket. And she screamed at them, what are you doing? And instead of just looking for any buttons that John might have had on his coat. This was pre Beatlemania. This was the early days of just the Merseyside mania. And that's really what made her think she's got to get out. She can't stand the kids coming to the front door. And as we were sitting at Comfort Cliffs, overlooking the sea in a smart bungalow, there was a boat going past down below. And as it was going past, I could hear a voice saying, Ladies and gentlemen, Look left and you'll see John Lennon's Auntie Mimi sitting on her back garden. <laughs> and she had absolute hysterics. I went to Hamburg and in Hamburg I tracked down Astrid. And people that know the Beatles saga, Astrid was engaged to Stu Sutcliffe, who was a member of the Beatles. He was the brightest talent at Liverpool College of Art and was John's best friend. And he won some money and John made him buy a guitar and made him join the group. And while they were in Hamburg, uh, he fell in love with Astrid and then he died of a brain hemorrhage. The thing about the Hamburg years, they were, I went to great trouble in the book to try and get it straight because I realized it was so important to them, the Hamburg years, because they really became themselves. They came from Liverpool while they were in Hamburg. It's like James Joyce going to Paris to write about Dublin. It was being away. And also, they perfected their music. And also, when they were in Liverpool, I have to choose my words carefully, because there is several girls here tonight who went to the Cavern Club. The Cavern Club was schoolgirls and secretaries and hairdressers. The fans they got in Hamburg, apart from the drunken sailors, were... Uh, intellectuals were art students and they could see things in the Beatles, especially in Stu and John, uh, which they loved. And Astrid took these amazing photographs of uh, the Beatles. I still think today these are the best photographs ever taken of the Beatles. There's one famous one. It looks like a, a railway station or a railway siding, but it's actually a fairground. So I went to see her and she hadn't been interviewed. And she was in a flat that was totally black. Black walls, black candles. 
black carpets, and she was still in mourning for Stu, the one who died, whatever it was, that's where I get things wrong, three or four years earlier. And she, I talked to her, and she was very good, and all the Beatles on their characters gave me really good insight. And then I went with her that evening. She was working in a lesbian club, and she was either serving in the bar or she was dancing with, if you arrived without a girl, you could dance with Astrid. I don't know what gigolo is a man, so gigola, is there such a, a noun? And I couldn't believe that she was doing this humdrum job, yet she was sitting on this massive archive of photographs. Later on, many years later, she did do books and did do her photographs. So I came back to London after the six months wandering around, and I saw the Beatles again, and I said, oh, I've seen Pete Best, and they all changed the subject. They didn't want to know, because they'd been horrible to Pete Best. And they'd hidden behind Brian, and made Brian do the dirty uh, deed, getting rid of them. There's another element of the Pete Best thing, which I knew at the time, but I couldn't write. And that was that Neil Aspinall, their roadie, and the Beatles' best friend, had had an affair and a child by Mona Best. Are you with me? Mona Best, Pete's mum. So when Pete got the sack, there was this other element in the background which nobody in Liverpool knew, that the Beatles were getting rid of Pete Best, and yet Neil, their roadie, and really the manager in the early days, was, Pete, was uh, the mother's lover. Uh, when I told them about Astrid, they were fascinated by Astrid, and I then started interviewing them properly. And one of the first real events I went to was the Maharishi. I was rung up the night before by Michael McCartney, Paul's brother, who said there's going to be a happening tomorrow. I said, oh, yeah. He said, I would come down to Euston Station. We're going to Bangor. I said, Bangor? So I went down to Euston Station, and the night before, the Beatles had met Maharishi, the Hilton, and it turned out TM, Transcendental Meditation, were having a conference at Bangor, and they all decided to go. So I went down to Euston Station, and even though they'd only decided the night before, there was holds of screaming kids, and it was chaos on the platform. And by a sequence of events, the roadies, Neil and Mal, got left behind, and Cynthia, wife of John, got left behind. So I found myself on the train going to Bangor in a first-class compartment, which was the old-fashioned sort, with banquettes and a door into the corridor, the four Beatles, dressed in all their 60s finery, uh, Mick Jagger and Marianne Faithful. So I sat in this carriage for four hours going up to Bangor. And every station, even though, as I say, it had been a last-minute decision, they would be putting, there'd be kids on the platform, because in those days you could open the windows, shoving books through for the Beatles to autograph, which they mostly did. But John would get fed up and say, I'm not signing them all these autographs. So I used to sign, if they got all the other ones, I would sign John's name. <laughs> and when these autographs come up at Sotheby's, and there's somebody from, several people from Sotheby's here this evening, I keep thinking, I wonder if that's, that's one of mine. <laughs> when, we got to, when we got to Bangor, we met the Maharishi, and we all got our mantra. And then we went out that evening to a Chinese restaurant in Bangor. This was in the summer of 67, and the university college or whatever it was at the time uh, was on vacation so they were staying there and we went to this restaurant and had a very good meal just me and the the Beatles I don't think Mick Jagger came and it turned out the bill came to something like 30 pounds and I only had 10 pounds on me the roadies had still not arrived and as soon as the Beatles became famous in 1963 say they became like the royal family, like the Queen, and didn't carry money. So they hadn't carried money. And we were late at night, and the waiters were standing at the background, listening to the Scouse accents, thinking, this is typical Saturday night. These lads come across from Liverpool, run up a bill, and they're going to do a runner. So they started closing the doors. And I said, well, you know, these are a famous pop group. I'll come back tomorrow and pay the bill, don't worry. And they were sharpening knives. And it was getting really... They wouldn't believe it. And suddenly... George put his foot on the table and he had a sort of homemade Indian pair of sandals, real leather, and he got a knife from the table and he sort of slipped round there 
And out of the sole of his sandal, he took a £20 note, which he'd put there the day he became a multimillionaire, thinking, one day, <laughs> it's going to happen. And so it happened. That was the, the weekend that we heard that Brian had died. It wasn't suicide, although he had been suicidal and he had tried to commit suicide some months earlier and left a note, which I never, nobody ever found. But it was, just to go back, I forgot to tell you about, on that train journey, I studied John and Mick Jagger for a long time, trying to get the dynamics. And they were friendly enough, but they weren't saying much. And a few months later, when I was interviewing John properly, I said, I study you on the train with Mick. How do you get on with them? You're not jealous of them, are you? Oh, certainly not. But I am of what the, the Rolling Stones have been able to do. I stand on stage and swear and spit and pick their nose and wear scruffy, awful clothes and be ugly and be people that, that scared the mums and dads. That was the image. Whereas the image of the Beatles was mop tops, clean and lovely and smiley and lovely clothes. And they did that because Brian said, you won't get anywhere in London unless you do it. And John hated that and regretted he had been so craven as to agree to all this. So he'd always been jealous of the Beatles, of the Rolling Stones, being able to act and dress the way they wanted to. And I said to him, but look, the Beatles, when the Beatles first came along, people actually thought they were amazingly refreshing and natural. They weren't wearing shiny suits. They didn't say, you're a lovely audience, and I mean that very sincerely. It was their refreshing uh, uh, reality that appealed to people. And really, the Rolling Stones wouldn't have got away with being the Rolling Stones, how they appeared, if you hadn't come first. So I started doing all the interviews, and I went to all the houses, and I went to see John. I remember going to see John in Kenwood, and I arrived, and it turned out it was a day for not talking. So he opened the door, not talking. Cynthia made us a meal, not talking. We sat and watched children's afternoon. It was a big house, but he just crouched in one little room watching children's television, not talking. And then we went round, had a swim in his swimming pool. I thought, bloody hell, I've come all this way in his day for not talking. And I swam in his pool, not talking. But while we were in the pool, Kenwood, where he lived, is in a very smart estate called, called St George's Hill. And down below, is the village of Weybridge. And while I was swimming around, we could hear a police siren making the noise they make today. Ah, 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 ah. And he started playing with that. It's not a tune, it's a rhythm. And he started going, ah, 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 which became across the universe. And he started thinking of it then, but it was some years later before he... Uh, really knocked it into shape because John would start things and not finish them and get bored and fed up. The, the best fun of all doing the book was, of course, being in Abbey Road during the making mainly of Sergeant Pepper. So I would go around the afternoon because we still live in the same house in North London, uh, just as Paul does, and I would go to Paul's house and I'd probably have a fry up with him because he wasn't a vegetarian in those days. Then we got with Martha. Who was Martha? Who was Martha? The dog, Martha, my dear. And I remember one day we went in his little mini car and we drove to Primrose Hill with Martha and we're walking up Primrose Hill. And it was very early in the year, about April, and the first dafts were appearing and it was getting warm and sunny. And I said to him, it's getting better, meaning spring is coming and the weather's getting better. And he said, yes, uh, and laughed. He said, again, it is getting better. You've got to admit it's getting better. I said, well, why is that expression funny? He said, when we were in Australia on their world tour, Ringo was ill for a while, and uh, a stand-in drummer came called Jimmy, Jimmy, Nichol. Jimmy Nickel. And after every concert, John would turn to Jimmy and say, how's it going, Jimmy? And Jimmy said only the same thing over and over again. It's getting better. It's getting better. And they used to mock him for saying... So Paul, this phrase made him laugh. And actually, as he walked home and talked about it, he started singing, you've got to admit it's getting better. And we came back, 
went to Paul's, up to his little studio, and he, then John arrived. And this is the, what they did during Sgt. Pepper. M by this stage, most of the songs were wholly written by one of them. But they would bring it in for the other one to knock into shape or to help with. Now and again, it was a mad panic at the end to do a song together, like a little help from my friends that needed that for Ringo. So John would come and they would sit up at the top and uh, work on It's Getting Better. And they would ask people in the room, like me or Cynthia or Terry Doran, what's a rhyme for sons? Oh, we can't have that. Uh, and I remember sitting in that little room and looking out over Paul's front yard, his, his lovely Georgian mansion, and you'd see heads appearing, girls' heads appearing over the wall, they'd be hanging on, trying to see if they're in. And then they would drop and disappear, and then they'd come back again. <laughs> and then we would then go around to Abbey Road, and they would do the the double tracking, they would start with the backing. And I, after hanging around for months, I was allowed to sit in the bowels of the Abbey Road. Upstairs would be a glass panel where George Martin was and the technicians. And if Mick Jagger came or the wives came, that was where they sat. But I was allowed to sit down below, but I never took notes. I just helped to put the symbols out, I just helped the roadies. And so I watched it happening and while during this three months or so, at the end of the session, they would have scraps of paper on which they had written the words of the song they were working on. They might write it out again when Ringo came. They would order Ringo on toast. That was always John's silly joke. Let's have Ringo on toast. And Ringo would be brought in. And I would pick it. If it was a song like It's Getting Better, or, uh, Strawberry, or songs I'd particularly seen all the way through, and wanted to write about in the book, I would pick them up and say, can I have this? They said, yes, because the cleaners are going to bin them. So 90% of these scraps were burned by the cleaners. And the thing about the Beatles, you've got to remember how young they were. They had no interest in from whence they had come. They had no interest in what they'd done yesterday. And the whole point of being in the studio was to record the song. So therefore, why would they keep the scrap of paper? The scrap of paper that sung the words, recorded it and played. So they got it down, Georgia got it on. So they had no interest in keeping these bits and pieces. This happened to them much later. In his 50s and 60s, Paul has been, and Yoko, are acquiring things behind the scenes. A lot of the stuff that's sold at Sotheby's. But in these days, they had no interest. So these particular bits that I picked up, uh, I picked up and kept them safely. While I was doing the book, I stupidly never used a tape recorder. I had tried a tape recorder on the Sunday Times once. I'd gone to see W.H. Auden, which would have, been, would have been my first mega interview. And I went to see him at Stephen Spender's house. And I was told by the literary editor, Leonard Russell, to give this envelope to Auden. And I thought, well, I'd better take a tape recorder. And I got a Grundig. It was the size of this room. <laughs> Absolutely enormous, and I was so obsessed by it, I couldn't really get it to work. I gave all, I actually looked in the taxi at what was in this envelope, and it was 30 brand new pound notes. And the minute I gave it to Auden, he had no interest in me, no interest in answering the question. He got his money, God knows what the money was for. So I was obsessed by this stupid Grundig thing, and he wasn't interested, and the interview never appeared. So I never used a tape recorder. So if only I used a tape recorder, when I was interviewing the Beatles for those 18 months. Wouldn't that have been a marvellous? Some people later, such as Barry Miles with uh, Paul, did it on tape recorder, didn't you, Barry? Yeah, I wish I'd done it. What I did do, when I was in the, in the bowels of uh, when they were making their music, or uh, when I went to the Sergeant Pepper photograph session, the famous Peter Blake one, I wouldn't write notes then I would just be hanging around. By the way, I took one of the objects in that famous Sergeant Pepper photograph. It's a sort of funny obelisk. I was in Paul's house and we're getting ready to go. And he said, we've got the flowers in the front, the crocuses spelling beetles. Well, let's put some objects in, look around the room. So I just took it from his uh, mantelpiece and I got to the Flood Street, was it? I got to where the photograph was taking place and I put it down and it stayed there and you can see where I put it. Anyway, at that session, uh, 
I didn't write notes, but it was amazing because in the corner was a statue of, not a statue, a cutout of Hitler. They were going to have Hitler in the lineup of all the famous gurus and the famous people. And at the last minute, Johnny Ming talked out of it. Look at the trouble he had with Jesus. And when I came home that evening, I, and when I came home from it, watch, listening to the music beat, I would write my notes up immediately, which was still in my head. And I've got those pages of saying, and Hitler was watching us describe what it was. When I was at the houses, individual houses, doing one-to-one -one interviews, I would get my little notebook out and I would write down the memories of school and the answers and the first impressions. And uh, so I've got 40 little red notebooks and I can't read a bleeding word by <laughs> writing so appalling. But the other day I was looking up something and I found out when I was interviewing Paul, I was asking him the famous meeting with John at Wilton Parish Church when the quarrymen are playing and John is, uh, Paul is brought around by a mutual friend and afterwards he plays his guitar, 20 flight rock and John's impressed and eventually asks him to join and I was saying to, to Paul, can you remember what was John wearing when you first met him? And he said, give us your book and he drew a beautiful cartoon drawing because Paul's a very good artist. He did a lovely drawing of John Lennon the day he met him with his slick back hair and his teddy boy style. And that's still in that notebook. I haven't been through these 40 notebooks, but they're going to the British Library. Where's Jamie? I, <laughs> if, they, if they want them. Those uh, uh, scraps I picked up, I then kept them safely at home. All the books I've done, I've done a book on Hadrian's Wall, and I kept all the fort tickets, I kept all the museum guides, I kept the bus tickets. I'm a great squirreler. I keep everything. And when I did a book about football, I kept the laundry list for the football team. And of course, I kept all the Beatles stuff, and they're the ones that's become valuable. The rest are not valuable. Before the end of the book, I didn't want to stop writing the book, because the Beatles, every time I saw them, they were into something new intellectually or spiritually or musically and they were changing all the time and as anybody here was alive in the 60s every new album that came out was the most amazing event because you knew it wouldn't be like the last one there'd be new sorts of music new songs obviously but new influences and new background music and I had to rush at the final moment I tracked down Ringo's real dad Ringo his mum had split from his dad, I've forgotten what age, two years old, and the dad had disappeared totally in his life, never reappeared, even though Ringo was now a multimillionaire. And I thought, I must get, because I want to know where the stars come from, the star kids, I should say. What's that family from? Does he remember? And I tracked him down, and he was a window cleaner and crew. I remember going to see him, and I wrote him a thank you to Mr. Starkey, and I spelt Starkey wrong, and he told me, told me off as misspelling his name. Then just before the book went to press, I made contact with Freddie Lennon. Freddie did a runner when John was very little and uh, Julia got a new partner and Mimi brought up. But when John became famous, the bold <laughs> Freddie reappeared <laughs> and gave interviews to Ravalli. He was a washer up and somebody said, Lennon, isn't your name Lennon? There's one of those Beatles. Oh. Really? And he realised his son, whom he hadn't seen for 40, no, I can't say 40 years, 20 years, 15 years, was now the famous John Lennon. And he got his teeth done and he cut a record, but he couldn't pay for his teeth. And then they, the Daily Express tried to spring him on John and we didn't manage it. The big thing was that Mimi had blackened Freddie's name and John knew that Mimi would be absolutely furious if, he knew, if she knew that he was seeing Freddie Lennon, that, that Freddie. So I managed to track Freddie down at the last minute and he was washing up in a hotel, a roadside hotel in somewhere like Twickenham, not very far from where John was living. And he was in his 50s and he was having an affair with an 18 year old girl who was doing part-time relief. She was at Exeter University, a well brought up uh, middle-class girl, how he'd managed to capture this girl, I don't know. 
Uh, so I talked to Freddie, and I got from Freddie his life story, how his father had been a Kentucky minstrel in America and been there and played music, and how Freddie had met the mother, got the whole story. I don't know how much he exaggerated, but I got it, so I just slapped it all down. And I thought he was witty and amusing and funny. So next time I saw John, I said, I met your dad. So he's a bit cagey at first. And I said, yeah, he's hilarious. John always said, when people asked him, or people said, what do you think you would have been in life if you hadn't been a Beatle? Paul could have been anything. Paul's multi-talented. Paul could have been an artist or a professor or worked at the British Library. He could have done lots of things. But John always knew he'd probably end up as a bum and probably end up like his dad, washing dishes. Because he wasn't good, a good enough artist to get a job and he was untidy and filthy. And his, his drawings were uh, sweet and funny, but he couldn't, have got, he couldn't have been a graphic designer. So he always said he would have ended up like Freddie, not having met Freddie. So he said, where is he living? So he then wrote a letter to Freddie and swore Freddie, oh, the letter's in the book, by the way. He swore Freddie to secrecy in case Mimi finds out. And Freddie arrives with his uh, girlfriend, Pauline, John finds him absolutely hysterical and lets him move in. Lets the girlfriend move in and they get married and he pays for the wedding and then he goes off them but he buys them a flat. And then Freddie sort of disappears from his life. But Freddie gets married, so Pauline Lennon, who's not coming to this event, alas, she's too busy, Pauline Lennon is really John's stepmother and she's helped me with some letters. So I did those two people at the very end and I did them uh, very quickly, finding them. All the Beatles had to read the book, and they had no objections. Brian was dead, and his mother inherited my contract. She was called Queenie, and she said John, uh, Brian was not homosexual. Now, I wanted to put it in because one of the strange things about Brian was why should this middle-class public school boy who likes Sibelius have gone to the cavern to listen to these boys? And it was because he fantasised about John, the butch John. And that's really... And Brian... I had... I, it, was, it was an awkward time because the Wolf and the Revolt was coming out. But I did put in that Brian was a gay bachelor. But he had girlfriends but had never married. So you got it between the lines. I didn't do... One of the things... When the book came out... People said, especially in America, it was amazingly realistic and truthful and honest and searing. I did have the F word in it. I did have LSD. I did have John screaming and shouting and being... But I didn't go into the groupies, and I've been accused by the diehard Beatle fans ever since for, not, for doing a whitewash by not explaining what happened in the dressing rooms and the hotels. And the reason for doing it was that I thought everybody alive then, adult, knew what pop stars were like. And I thought I didn't have to go into And it wasn't really relevant, whereas I felt Brian's sexuality was relevant to the story. And also, all four Beatles were happily partnered or married. And nobody asked me not to do it, but I thought it would just be embarrassing for them to draw attention to the orgies in the dressing rooms. But then I got a letter from John saying, Mimi's having hysterics. Will you go down to Bournemouth and calm her down? And I went to see her. She got a hold of a copy somehow. And she said, John never swore when he was a little boy and he didn't steal and I don't want it in the book. <sighs> and I said, well, it's John's story. I can't change it. I can't alter it. I can't put words into his mouth. So in the end, we compromised. And I put at that particular chapter a paragraph from Mimi at the very end of this chapter when John's doing all these awful things. And I quote Mimi saying, and Mimi said that John's childhood, he was as happy as the day was long. So that keep, kept her happy. The Beatles, uh, I, kept those, I kept those manuscripts at home in a drawer, the Beatle lyrics, then I put them on the wall. Then when my children became teenagers and had awful parties, I thought, oh God, somebody's going to be sick over them. Then I woke up one day in 1981 or two when Sotheby's had the first sales of Beatle lyrics and I found I got nine of them and... Uh, I realised the, the lyrics, the scraps of paper, were worth more than my house. <laughs> so I thought, oh, God, I, I, I like them all. I don't want to sell them. 
because I've got a very successful, hard-working wife. I don't need the money, and Paul would never speak to me again. But I want them all kept together. I remember talking to Graham C. Green, who was the boss of Jonathan Cape, and he had some Graham Green stuff, and he'd offered the British Museum and said, oh, no, we don't want that. Try the Bodleian. So I rang the British Museum, and they were absolutely thrilled, as Jamie said. And they went into the, uh, the manuscript room at the British Museum, and then when the British Museum moved here, they've gone in the manuscript room here, as Jamie said, the next to Magna Carta and the next to Shakespeare and Wordsworth. When the Queen opened the British Library and was taken round, the, uh, the case with the Beatles stuff, and my name's not on them, you don't know who it is, but you see these scraps, and now these days you can listen to the tunes as you're reading. Uh, the Queen apparently stood and spent a long time, she couldn't read the words of Magna Carta, no more than David Cameron can read the words of Magna Carta. <laughs> no more than I can, because it's in medieval Latin. But of course, you could read the words of yesterday. So the, the, in my will, they go to the nation. So I'm thrilled if you haven't seen them, go and have a look at them. And they're still there upstairs. Uh, I'm now going to tell you about, I can't see the time. I'm going to tell you about the, the, dark, the letters, how I came to do the letters. I told you how as I used to run the Atticus column. Six months before I did the Beatles biography, I met Yoko before she met John. One day in 66, I think, I, the phone rang and this strange sounding woman with a strange sounding accent said, I'm told you the most famous columnist in London, will you appear in my Bottoms film? I said, what? My Bottoms film? And I said, piss off. I, I was convinced <laughs> it was a friend from the Observer. Because in 1966, there were only two papers, really. There was no Sunday Telegraph, hadn't been invented. There was no Mail on Sunday. And therefore, we were in deadly rivalry with Penn Dennis on the... But of course, we all knew each other. And the joy of being a journalist in the 60s was not only you went out and interviewed people, you left the office. But if you had a story with your name on, on the Sunday Times on a Sunday, everybody you met the next day would have read it. Because there are only two, you know the Jimmy Porter thing, getting the Sunday papers. They weren't as big as they are today because there weren't all the supplements. They were quite thin. So the normal middle class educated or whatever person would get the observer in the Sunday Times and your stuff, now today, I feel sorry for journalists today. There are so many papers and broadcasters and television. There's no, there's no way of everybody seeing what, you've, what you're proud of because it's all dissipated. And so I thought it was, she said, no, no, I've come from America. And I'm doing this film. So she told me the details. I said, well, I can't appear in it. My agent will not allow it. Ha, uh ha. -huh. Uh, so I went down to Park Lane and she put an advert on the stage you know the stage, the newspaper of the acting profession. And the advert said, words to the effect, would you like to appear in a film? Your appearance is guaranteed, but there'd be no fee. So I went down to Park Lane, and all these out-of-work actresses and actresses were queuing up, and they went into the, this room in Park Lane, door, and there was a, a children's a roundabout rendezvous. And as they went through the door, the girls had told to take their knickers down, and the boys had told her to take the trousers down, and they stood on this rendezvous, and there was a fixed camera filming the bottoms. And that was the film. So I did uh, a slightly tongue-in-cheek, mickey-taking piece about it in my column. I remember the headline I used, because the headline has been used a million times since. It's a very corny joke. Oh, no, oh, no. That same week, I'd been to Manchester University and I'd interviewed the first female president of the Manchester Students' Union, absolutely stunning girl called Anna Ford, who became the television personality and newsreader. And, she, and I had the headline on her, aha and ah. So it was, oh no, oh no. Anyway, uh, Yoko rang me up and said, thanks very much for the publicity. That was very kind of you. And I forgot all about it. So six months later, I went into Abbey Road, now doing the... Uh, biography and as I said earlier people weren't allowed on the bowels and the main floor 
And there she was, arm in arm, entwined with John. And the other Beatles are going, who the fuck is this? <laughs> and so I met her then and recognised her. And I stayed friendly with her. And she sent me postcards. And uh, when Sean was born, I got stuff. And then, I can't remember how many years ago, I said to her, there should be a book about John's letters. I've got three letters from John Lennon. I can let you read them. I can burn them. I can sell them at Sotheby's. What I can't do is publish them in a magazine or a book. The laws of copyright are roughly the same all around the world. For 70 years from the death of the, the person, the estate, in this case it's Yoko, owns the copyright, and you can't publish them without permission. Uh, next year, Beatrix Potter will be dead 70 years. Anybody can rip off Beatrix Potter's letters. So I've had these letters, and the thing about John Lennon was that he lived and died pre-computers, pre-email, and I know, because of my three letters, what a witty, amusing letter writer he was. In fact, his first reaction to most emotions, anger, fury, disgust, was to not just go to a guitar or a piano, was to write it down. We know about his two books, and he'd been writing all his childhood, scribbles and uh, stories and poems, and he... When he wrote a letter to somebody, he's first of all amusing himself, and secondly, he tailors it to the person who's writing to. And so there's jokes and references to do with the person he's writing to. And I, my idea was I'd use his letters, if I could find them, to tell John's life story in letters, because I feel that letters are the closest way you get to a person. Because they're not really writing for publication, they're writing, getting rid of an emotion straight immediately there and then. And I think, for example, that uh, Virginia Woolf's letters are brilliant, even more amazing than her diaries, because the diaries in half a mind, I think she's thinking, they'll be published, but in her letters, she's just throwing them off, and they're amazing, and John's are the same. And, but they don't exist. There are no John Lennon letters. I've got three. In fact, over the last three years, I don't think I've found anybody with more than three. Because John Lennon, when you're doing a book, I've done a book on Robert Louis Stevenson and uh, Wordsworth. When people have been dead for a long time, the letters accumulate in various places, such as Dove Cottage or a museum or, a, or the British Library. So they're all together. But when somebody's been dead for only a short time, as with... Uh, John, the recipients in the main still have the letters. Or you have stage two, which is they've sold them and a collector has them. So Yoko uh, eventually agreed to my idea. One of the ways I talked her into it was the fact that, uh, well, I said the obvious thing, I thought Beatles fans in the world at large would like to see his writing because you get an insight into his character. I also said that I'm going to build this book up. I'll tell the story of what John was doing at the time, who the recipient was, the relationship with the recipient, and I'll tell you the, the contents of the letter. But the sooner I do this book, the better, because the recipients are dying. Derek Taylor, the most lovely man, who was the PR for the Beatles, he's dead. He got lots of letters. And I need to be able to contact as many of those as possible for them to explain, because I won't get the jokes. And that really, she agreed to it. She first said it's too personal, but in the end, she said, no, you can do it. But she's got no letters from John Lennon. They had that one long time when they were apart, when he was in California, and they rang each other 20 times a day. She had some scraps, but I think they got stolen. So I've had to find the 300 letters that I wrote to everybody that was related to John, to, to his half-sisters, Julia and Jackie, and they were very helpful to Pauline Lennon, to his cousin, David Birch, who's never really been interviewed properly, but he's got a first cousin uh, who was very helpful. And then I th thought of all the people who might have got letters from him. And then I talked to collectors, and I contacted Sotheby's, Bonhams, and uh, Christie's, and they were helpful. I and I remember one person I'd met in 1970. Seven, the bicentennial year, I went to America on the QE2. And on the boat, I met, a man came up to me and said, I did enjoy your Beatles biography. 
My name is Bill Martin and I'm a songwriter. And it turned out he wrote Congratulations and Puppet on a String and all the Bay City Roller hits. I said, oh, amazing. And he said, I live in Kenwood. I said, you, you mean not in Kenwood, Hampstead? He said, no, John's house. I've bought it. I said, how amazing. So we chatted and I saw him on the boat a few times for drinks. And then for 30 years, I'd forgotten all about him. But when I started this project, I thought, I wonder if Bill Martin ever got a letter from John Lennon. Where is Bill Martin? So I tracked him down and said, did you write to John? And it turned out he had. After he'd bought the house, he wrote to John and said, I now own your house. The pool is rubbish. It's still leaking. Uh, when you were living here, what songs did you write living in Kenwood? And he wrote the letter back, giving all the songs. So for musicologists, and the world is full of them, that's a fascinating document. So I had such good luck with that sort of person coming forward and giving me the letters. And uh, I've got 300 in all. And a lot of these people have come here this evening. A lot of them I don't know face to face, but they've been absolutely uh, so helpful. Some of them are, some of the letters in the book, and the critics will probably say, these, say this, are totally banal and totally bread and butter, two pints a day, please, milkman. But the reason for using them is that very often there's a good story attached with a really uh, trivial letter. For example, there's one letter that says, To Lizzie, thanks for a lovely year, John Lennon. And this is a letter to a girl called Lizzie Bravo. In 1967, she's a middle-class girl from Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, and her mum as a present gave her the money to come to London, and she came with a girlfriend. And all they came to do, didn't tell their mother, was to hang around Abbey Road. And there were the people climbing on the wall outside <laughs> Paul's house and hanging around Abbey Road. And then one evening outside Abbey Road, their fantasy came true. The door of Abbey Road opened. It was a Sunday evening. And Paul came out, and everybody screams. And he says, can any of you girls hold a note? And they all hand, put their hands up. And he picks two, Lizzie Bravo and another girl. And they go inside. And that evening, they, are, they had the thought of trying to get a professional singers to come in, but it was Sunday evening, and the girls sang Nothing's Good. They're doing Across the Universe, the one I mentioned earlier. And the girls were to sing for two hours the same two lines, Noth the same one line, Nothing's going to change my world. Nothing's going to... And they got all the Beatles autographs. When I first read this, this scrap that she sent me, I thought, oh, it's a groupie. It's a one-night stand. But it was a total lovely relationship. So isn't that a good story? She's now a grandmother living in uh, uh, Brazil. And there's a folk singer. I'll tell you one other little story. I hope she's coming this evening. A girl called Tolly Onan. I think I've got the name right. Is that her? Oh, God. I might have got this wrong. But this woman, this girl, was aged about... She was living in England, and she's Mongolian background. And she... This was towards the last year of John's life. And she... Don't correct me, Tolly. She wrote to John because she was... She loved what he was doing for peace, and she loved him marrying Yoko and bringing East and West together, because in her background. And she wrote a letter to them. And John read this letter... And he gave two interviews. He gave the famous last interview to the BBC with Andy Peebles. And he gave another interview in which he mentioned this Mongolian girl who had written to him. He didn't say her name. He didn't say any clues. In fact, if you listen to this thing, you would think it was like politicians saying, and a constituent told me only last week, or I met somebody in the butchers. You thought it was sort of made up. Tolly wrote to me, I don't know how she knew I was doing the book, but I told everybody, and she sent me the lovely letter, postcard, which nobody had ever seen, from John. John sent the postcard back to her. And this little girl, Tolly Onam, who was 14 now, is now a professor and consultant gynaecologist in Manchester. <laughs> and she's come here this evening. Isn't that a brilliant story? So one of the pleasures for me, and there's about 100 stories like that in the book, which I've tried to tell connected with it. So I think I'm going to show the, the film now. This has got nothing to do with John Lennon, this film. 
And my wife says, you're absolutely stupid. Nobody wants to see this silly film. It's, I made this joke of it being a world premiere. It's a super eight film, which I did of all my little children in the 60s. And then I spliced it together. I got burn holes all over the place. If you remember Super 8, uh, there's no sound. After the Beatles book came out, I don't know, I've got my specs on. After the Beatles book came out, we had a year abroad. Our children were four and five, or three and five, or four and six. And I thought, this is a fantasy that all writers have. They all say, oh, if I make any money, I'm going abroad. I'm not coming back here. I'll be in the south of France. So we did it for a year, and it was utterly boring. But we're in, <laughs> in Portugal, and we rented a house at Prada de Luge, which is the place where the girl was abducted from. Remember, Madeline. Uh, we were living in a cot uh, converted sardine factory right on the Prada Luge beach. There was no Luge Bay Club. There was no modern buildings. This is 1968-69. And in the middle of the night one night, it was the most stunning house, and the big wall garden, not wall garden, wooden fence garden, we had a gardener that came with it and a housekeeper, and the garden was full of statuary and lovely plants. It was owned by apparently a gynecologist from Belfast. So gynecologists do well, don't they? <laughs> and we just rented it for the winter cheaply because it was the winter. Anyway, at two in the morning, I heard the most awful banging, shouting on the big wooden door outside. And I could hear a gruff Portuguese voice. And I could hear, Hunter Davis, you lazy bastard, get up. And I thought it was John Lennon because the voice was so raucous. And it was Paul. So I went outside, and there was a taxi driver looking worried. <laughs> and Paul was with a blonde American girl I'd never seen in my life before, because when I last seen Paul, he was engaged to Jane Asher. And I thought they were a lovely couple. I thought that was it. And there was a little girl with them called Heather, Linda's daughter. And there was an R8 taxi driver who had just driven 80 kilometers from Faro Airport, which hadn't long opened, a year or two, and Paul had no money. <laughs> what had happened in London that evening, in St. John's Wood, he'd just met Linda, and Linda's child had arrived from the father of the child, it was Linda's term, and he thought, we'll go and see Hunter. Hunter's got two children about this age. Paul adores children. So he said to Neil the roadie, get us on a plane to Faro. And Neil comes back and said, all the planes have gone, we'll hire one. So they hired a private jet, and they left within half an hour having thought about it. And he left so quickly, he brought two things. He brought a bottle of whiskey, half of my wife, of course, and he brought a 50 pound note. They got to Faro Airport in the middle of the night because they didn't come to our house till two. So a private jet arrives. Paul has got a big beard, as you will see in a minute. And you couldn't really tell who it was, but a private jet in the middle of the night. He staggers around the airport and he sees some official looking person and said, oh, can you change this into a skewdos? Gives this man the 50 pound notes. Then over there, he sees a taxi driver and says, taxi, and he runs off, leaving this bloke with a 50 pound note and never sees him again. So he jumps in the taxi with no money. So I pay off the taxi driver and they come inside and we have some cocoa, I should think, and settle down, put them in bedrooms. And they stayed with us for three weeks coming, coming up to Christmas. And we had a brilliant time. And Paul hired a car. We had a row once because he would drive the car with Caitlin, my oldest daughter, who was here this evening, on his knee. He would let her drive the car. And I said, don't be stupid. If you crash it, he said, they've got to learn. <coughs> <coughs> he, brought his, <coughs> he brought his guitar with him. And... <coughs> He, wants, <coughs> he had hysterics when he found out my name, first Christian name, is not Hunter. I never reveal this because I never knew it myself until I was 11. My full name is Edward Hunter Davis, but I've never, ever been called Edward. Now and again at secondary school, the, the, the nurse would come looking for nits and would say, Edward, come out. And I would think, who was Edward? Poor sod having... And it was me. So he laughed at this and I... I said, you need talk because your first name is not Paul. 
Paul's first name is James. And anyway, we went to the lavatory this evening with his guitar and came because he took it and he came back and sang me a song, which went as follows, but my voice is going. There you go, Eddie, 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 there you go, Eddie, Eddie, you've gone. And I never heard anything else about that until somebody <laughs> somebody sent me a bootleg. You know, bootlegs are they're sort of stolen somehow from the recording studio. Some of the people have uh, they've been recorded. And I could hear him singing this song to John, and he has another verse to it by that time. And the other verse is not very flattering. The other verse goes, you think you're in with the in crowd. <laughs> Which I'm sure I never thought I was. Uh, but it was never recorded. Wouldn't that be marvellous if it... Um... <laughs> so the next day, the press arrive from Lisbon. And I'm absolutely amazed but it's somebody at the airport had realised who Paul was and the word went round and they said, a Beatle has arrived. So the press arrived. And during these three weeks, what was funny after... You're going to see this little film in a minute. What was funny was that for two or three days, all the people from Lagos, which is the local lovely town, arriving all day long, giving free things, bringing wine and fruit and meat and that was my first uh, observation of what we all know the rich people don't pay the rich people get things for nothing the richer you are the more free things you get and all this free stuff was coming and I said oh because they wanted Paul to go to his restaurant or go use his butchers or whatever uh, so the press arrived from Lisbon and he agreed to give one little press conference on the beach and said that, uh, but I'm on holiday, will you not come again? And don't say, don't say which town or which, where I'm staying. And they didn't, so we had three lovely weeks and we had a, a great time. <laughs> Thank you. 